welcome all of you. My name is Greg Horn. I'm the city manager for the city of Centerville, and it's nice to have all of you here today. Uh, we have a, uh, an opportunity today, I think, to discuss the compressed natural gas. I'm sure there are folks in the audience that know a lot more about it than I do. Uh, but we've been talking about it at the city of Centerville for the last several months, and we've had some discussions with the uh, Montgomery County Waste District about possibly uh, implementing a CNG program for the waste haulers. Many of the municipalities haul in and out of the transfer station. Uh, they're off of Dryden in the uh, South Dayton Moraine area. And we've discussed the possibility of maybe switching over our refuse fleets to CNG. And we've been exploring kind of individually some of the pros and cons of that. And uh, Pat Turnbull with the Montgomery County Sanitary Engineer's Office uh, is here today. He's been working with us with a subcommittee that's been uh, exploring this as an option. Um, I know a lot of the schools that are represented here today, a lot of the cities and counties are, are doing some individual things, and some of you have probably progressed much further than, than others in terms of alternative fuels. Uh, the city of Centerville, you know, we've, we've made some minimal strides. We've purchased some hybrid vehicles. We have some flex uh, fuel vehicles. We just received a grant. I think we're going to be uh, probably one of the first communities in this part of the state. I know Dublin has done it in the Columbus area, but we'll be installing an electric uh, charging station in our downtown area in the next few weeks. We also have an electric vehicle charging station that will be uh, installed here close to the municipal building in a, in a public parking area as well. So those are a couple of things that, that we're just starting to do. Um, I've been a city manager for some 35 years, and, and if you would have told me in, in the 19, late 1970s that we would still be using diesel or gasoline as a primary fuel source, uh, for, for our vehicles, I really wouldn't have believed it. Um, I can remember in the 1970s, I was a college student in Bowling Green. In the early 70s, during the, uh, the oil embargo, working at a gas station when we were filling up people going to, uh, to Florida from Michigan, you know, on even odd days, people arguing about whether they could get enough gasoline to get on their way to Florida when the, when the rationing was taking place. Um, worked for a pizza shop, Pizzadellos, if any of you are from Northwestern Ohio. 1974, again, gasoline was, uh, was at a shortage, and uh, we went to electric vehicles to deliver pieces in in 1974. Uh, they only used them for a couple of years, but again, at that time, I wouldn't have believed that uh, electric cars would not have progressed maybe a, a lot more quickly than what they have over the past uh, 40 years. Um, in the early 1980s, I was a city manager at a community up in northeastern Ohio, and we, along with many other communities there, switched over our our uh, police department fleet to propane because we went through a period of time around 1980-82 that we saw a huge increase in gas prices. And so all of you have been through these ups and downs over the years and a lot of these things have started but they just haven't uh, really come to fruition. Uh, I think it appears now from what you're going to hear today with some of the things that are happening in the natural gas industry, especially in Ohio with the new explorations that are underway, it looks like we may be at the point where we really are into a situation now where there is an alternative and it's an alternative for the, the long-term future that, that may be very wise for us to consider investing in. Uh, as we had our discussions the last few weeks with the Solid Waste District and we were all kind of doing our individual research, um, I occasionally check the Worcester Daily Record <coughs> website because I'm originally from Worcester, Ohio. And uh, Orville was a neighboring community that used to beat the heck out of us when I was in high school in football every year. And I noticed in Orville, Smith Dairy, and uh, that's their, their headquarters, and Orville's always been known for Smith Dairy and Smuckers, and I noticed a couple of articles about Smith Dairy uh, going to compress natural gas and switching, the goal to switch their entire fleet over to that. <coughs> the more I read, the more intrigued I, I became, because unlike a lot of places that have started to go to compress natural gas, Smith Dairy was doing it as a true entrepreneurial uh, event. No federal grants, no stimulus money, no state grants. They were just doing it by good old uh, ingenuity and initiative. Uh, made a couple of phone calls up there, and Chuck Deal uh, was put in contact with me, and we've had several calls since then, and Norbert Klopp, city manager in Oakwood, has set in on some of those. Chuck has been extremely helpful, uh, very cooperative, and the more I talked to him, the more I thought he had a story that should be shared, and that's really how today has come about. Uh, Chuck is going to be our main presenter today, and then he has a panel of three individuals that he'll be introducing. Uh, that will be available for question and answers as well. Uh, a little bit about Chuck, who I'd never met until today, but talked to him on the phone several times. Uh, his career at Smith Dairy has spanned uh, over 38 years. Uh, he's a second generation Smith Dairy employee, as his father started there in 1959 in home delivery. And 
retired in 91. Chuck's held positions at Smith's, including a fleet shop technician for 12 years, human resource manager for two years, the Wayne Dairy Division manager for eight years, and then uh, charged with the Smith Dairy Trucking Fleet. He was a manager of that for 15 years. Chuck is responsible uh, currently for the Smith Dairy's entire 400 truck vehicle fleet. Uh, he implemented Smith Dairy's first uh, and, and existing CNG project in 2012. Smith Dairy built one of Ohio's first public CNG heavy truck fuel sites. He's also purchased and deployed their first uh, CNG tractors uh, during this same time. Chuck is currently developing Smith's fuel doctrine that will have Smith Dairy trucking uh, diesel independent by 2030. And Chuck and his wife Cynthia uh, have a married daughter and a single son and one grandchild reside in the Orville area. So at this time I'd like to welcome Chuck up. Please give him a uh, warm and cheerful center of all. Yeah, thank, you. thank you, Greg. Thanks, Greg, and thanks for the city of Centerville and everyone that's uh, here this, this morning. And if uh, uh, you, you were paying attention to what Greg said as far as my bio, you, you uh, recall that uh, my, my father started the dairy in 1959. Now, that, now the dairy is family owned, uh, privately operated by the Schmidt family. I'll, I'll address that here in a little bit. But I'm, I'm second generation as far as employment. And, and as Greg mentioned, my father uh, uh, began at the dairy in 1959 in home delivery. So I know what you're thinking, right? He's the milkman's kid. <laughs> okay, so let's just get that out now, okay? <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, I was a teenager before I found out that wasn't a compliment. <laughs> yeah, but, but it's true, and you're, and you're looking at one, and uh, I'm thankful for that. Uh, with that said, that... Uh, and as, as Greg uh, uh, mentioned, that gave uh, myself, uh, my brothers, one of our key account salesmen at the dairy, uh, that gave uh, us many opportunities to get to know the dairy business inside and out and get to know uh, beyond that the delivery system. Because I'm responsible, if it has license plates and, t and uh, wheels on it, it's mine. And you know, of course, if it has license plates and wheels, it's going to give you problems. And they do. Um, so it, it gave us a very good opportunity to, to learn dairy, to learn distribution, and then to be, as Greg said, prepared for things like alternate fuel and, and as we've uh, taken our steps towards a CNG. So if I may, uh, just a, a, a moment of housekeeping, so to speak, uh, what we'd like to do, if it's all right with you, I know everybody's uh, busy today, uh, I'll, I'll give my presentation, and I've got uh, some slides and things to go through, but any, any uh, step along the way, if you see something on a slide, you want to ask a question, if there's something I say uh, that you want to ask a question, you know, get a hand up. Like, I really enjoy the interaction. Don't save the question for the end. Now, with that said, uh, we'll, we'll probably take a break, a short break right after that. And then we'll get our, our, our panelists up here who are going to give us some uh, further insight on, on the, the CNG industry and what's going on out there in the field. And we'll come back and they'll make a presentation and same, same uh, uh, ground rules, so to speak. Uh, if you have a question, get that hand up. And, and I, uh, I want this to be, I think, as is, is, is Greg and, and Norv know from our conversations on the phone, this has to be a learning experience for you and the interaction is, is, is key as we go here. So with that said, I need to uh, get on the right presentation here. And if I may, I'll, I'll walk through this and uh, let's see if this makes sense and, uh, and we'll, we'll, be, we'll be off and running. But uh, part of that interaction is gonna be more than me just uh, saying things. Uh, making statements. I'm going to begin with a question, and, I, and I'm, I'm looking for you to answer this question for me, at least by the time I get done with my presentation. Uh, I drove out last night from uh, Northeast Ohio, Orville's in Wayne County. We're just uh, um, an hour south of Cl Cleveland, and as Greg mentioned, the Orville Red Riders have, have had a couple state championship football teams. Did uh, 
grow up thumping the Worcester Generals quite often. Greg, that wasn't the case this year. Worcester took them down. But anyway, my question is, uh, why is diesel, why is the cost of diesel right now this morning 70 to 80 cents higher than the cost of no lead? Those of us that have been in the, in the trucking industry know that somewhere in the, in the 90s, diesel used to be less. Uh, I remember being uh, at home uh, last winter, wasn't feeling good uh, one weekend, and turned the TV on, and one of my favorite movies was on, uh, Smokey and the Bandit. You know, Burt Reynolds, Jerry Reed, you know, uh, all that. And I remember in the opening shot, uh, when Jerry Reed pulled that 18-wheeler out on the road, he was from a truck stop, there was a sign, and it said diesel, 45.9. We, some of us remember 45.9, but diesel was always less than gas back then. Somewhere in the 90s, that changed, where diesel became higher than gasoline. It was just high enough to say there was a difference, right? But driving out last night, the pilots, the Flying Jays, I saw no diesel advertised that wasn't 70 to 80 cents higher than no lead. I want you to answer that for me when we're done. That's a problem. Let's go on. Um, Smith Dairy, and, and by way of, of introducing our, our fleet of, uh, of uh, natural gas trucks, uh, I do work for the Schmidt family. Uh, Steve and John Schmidt are our third generation uh, to, in uh, the ownership to the dairy, to the dairy business. Uh, Steve's son, Nate, uh, is soon to join us, and he'll be fourth generation. That's, if you've worked for a family, that's blessing or curse, right? Uh, but in this case, it's been much so uh, a blessing. Now, part of, part of the thing that you have to know about the Schmidt family, they are big environmentalists. Fact is, uh, one of them I would have to say is a certified tree hugger. That's okay, he's a certified tree hugger. Uh, now keep in mind, we started business with, with horses, okay? You don't get much greener than horses, okay? And we, we still have a, a horse-drawn horse dairy wagon and things like that. But in, in the case of the Schmidt family, more than environmentalists, because I know that word gets kicked around a lot, and if you're in business, you're hearing about being green, you're hearing about reducing your carbon footprint, you're hearing about what are we going to do to save the world for the future generations. We know and understand all that. But in the case of the Schmidt family, more than environmentalists, they're conservationalists. Now that word doesn't get used a lot today. What is a conservationalist? Give me a definition. A conservationist is simply this. Now, come on, folks. I'm going to look for some interaction here. A conservationist is simply this. If a conservationist takes one, they always give back more than one. They always give back more than one. And uh, the Steve and John Schmidt and the Schmidt family run their company that way. They have heavily invested in their, in their company through the years. They believe that's the way uh, a family should operate. They believe that's the important thing for the environment, to give back more than we uh, have taken. And that got us on the road to C&G. So if, if I may, uh, Smith Dairy Trucking at a glance. And if I may, and, I, and I, I include this snapshot just so you understand a little bit who we are. And I, and I know, I, 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 I'm going to guess we're talking a lot of uh, city, county, I don't know if there's some state folks here. We've certainly got law enforcement here, managers here, um, hopefully some fleet guys here. But a lot of times I'll put this uh, slide up just, to, just so you can look at this and say, hey, you know, that's kind of what we look like. That's kind of our fleet size. Uh, and let me just stop there for a moment uh, and say thank you to this area of Ohio. <coughs> You've been very good to Smith Dairy. We have served uh, the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for many, many years, and thank you for that. We serve uh, the, the Meyer stores. When you go into the, your local Meyer store and you pick up that gallon of, of milk that says Meyer, came out of our plant. We just put a Meyer label on because that's what Meyer likes us to do. If you've ever uh, had some Grater's ice cream, that's our mix. Grater's takes our mix and does their magic with it, but uh, that, that's ours. Uh, so Chipotle, Arby's in the area, uh, we, we, we supply all of those. So let me just say that to say this, 
thank you to uh, everyone in this area. You've been very good to Smith Dairy. But with that said, Smith Dairy Trucking at a glance, this, this is who we are, and uh, this, this is uh, what we're doing. We're based out of Ohio. We call Ohio home. We run Ohio. Uh, and as far as retail is concerned, we run uh, throughout most of the lower 48 uh, uh, with common carriers. So let, let's get to the, the point of why we're here today, the case for CNG. We've known through the years it's, it's difficult to operate a fleet. It's difficult to pay for a fleet. And uh, many times uh, we, we spend a lot of time in investing in, in, in things to do with our fleet that just save us pennies, that just save us fractions, that just save us uh, 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 a percentage of, of, of uh, fuel economy and make our fleet more efficient. I call this the low-hanging fruit. We, we addressed uh, getting the weight off the trucks. Uh, we, we, we don't have a truck with two fuel tanks on it. Uh, we, we, we're a single tank. We, there's no sense to carry all that weight. Uh, we, we do not run uh, static routes. We run active routes. Those routes are different every day. There's no sense to run the same miles twice. Uh, if you see our, some of our equipment in this area, the trailers, you're going to see the side skirts on the trailers. It's tough to make a 53-foot box aerodynamic, but we've all been trying to do it. Uh, we've taken the dual tires off the trailers and trucks and gone with the single wide base tires. We've done a lot of those things to make our fleet more efficient. So we've, we've addressed this whole idea of fleet efficiency and what I'm going to call the low-hanging fruit. So if you came in this morning and thinking, okay, CNG, here's one more thing that somebody's just going to throw out and let's see if it sticks, right? Well, I hope that is not what is going to be presented this morning. Uh, but I just want you to know, before we ever got to CNG, we've worked very, very hard to make our fleet more efficient. So what was left? Well, when uh, our sustainability team has met, we've looked at the, the, the idea of our fuel source, which Greg mentioned, um, uh, fuel source in, in some of the places he worked. He mentioned electric vehicles. We had electric delivery trucks back in the 40s. They were called walkers. They had a little continental gas engine on them, running a little uh, electric generator, and they, they run off a battery pack. I told you before that we were horses. You don't, you don't get much greener than horses. But uh, we've been predominantly, and right now we are a predominantly uh, diesel fleet. Running about six million miles a year is, is how many miles we cover. So what I'm trying to say is if the, if the low-hanging fruit were those side skirts, those wide base tires, those things that we were trying to do to be more effective and efficient, the high-hanging fruit was certainly our fuel source. And we chose, as we looked at uh, our fuel sources, we chose that uh, we thought CNG would be the best way to get started. So our, our proposal was simply this. Uh, you, you don't just get started in CNG. You can go buy the truck. You can go buy the van. You can go buy whatever's powered by CNG, uh, but you, you better figure out where you're going to get your fuel. And in this case, the, the industry is, is referred to this many times. Uh, I know uh, Jerry and Charlie and Craig and Ken and I have all been to, to, to meetings where uh, you, we've heard this whole chicken and egg scenario, and maybe some of you have heard that. Well, do I buy the truck? Do I build the fuel site? It's the chicken and egg. Well, we, we didn't really struggle with that too much because we're in a dairy business, and you know, we take that whole chicken and thing. That, you know, that's kind of, you know, what are you guys talking about? It's more the milk and the cow, right? Or the cow and the milk. And, and in our case, you, you never separate the two. So there was, there was never much of a decision there. We knew we needed both. So our proposal was simply this, was we were gonna build our, we knew we needed to build our fuel site, and then of course we knew we needed trucks. Well, you hear a lot of talk uh, in, the, in the industry about infrastructure. And of course, this is whether you're talking gasoline, diesel, CNG, propane, whatever. Where's your infrastructure? We knew we would have to tackle this in, 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 in four components. I mentioned the trucks. Uh, we, we partnered with the folks from Freightliner. Now, Freightliner's not the only guys that are out there uh, building CNG trucks. There's a lot of other people doing a very, very good job. Just in our case, we chose Freightliner to get started. Um, our trucks are, uh, uh, have the Cummins Westport dedicated uh, 
nine liter engine in them, they only run on CNG. So we, our trucks were the, the Freightliner ones. Uh, we moved ahead uh, with the fuel site. We took our, our existing uh, diesel fuel site, and, and if, if I have uh, time here in just a few minutes, I'll run through uh, some slides on our fuel site, our fuel site itself. We took our existing diesel fuel site and then uh, blended in uh, a CNG fuel site right with it. And what we did, we uh, blended in for our own drivers to have diesel and CNG on the two traffic lanes that they, they go through. And then because uh, the Schmidt family want, uh, wants to, or is uh, very environmental and conservationist uh, uh, conscious, uh, we opened our fuel site up to the public. It's a public fuel site. It's a 24-7 fuel site. And I'll show you more on that here in a little bit. Uh, one of the components is technician training. And uh, I'll have a slide on that. Uh, if, if you're going to approach CNG, uh, there again, with, with your fleet, uh, whomever your fleet serves, expect a lot of training. And I'll touch on more of that here in, in a moment. And then there's shop modifications. Keep in mind, CNG is a gas. I'll say that again. CNG is a gas. We refer to gasoline as a gas, but it's not. It's a liquid. It's a whole different way of looking at things when you look at a liquid fuel source versus a gaseous or gas fuel source. So you're going to have some uh, building modifications in, in your shop uh, to consider. Project goals, and of course, uh, any of you that have been involved with any projects, uh, hey, what's a project without some goals, right? Well, here, here were our three. We knew uh, of the three things we wanted to do. We wanted to reduce our truck tailpipe emissions. We knew we wanted to do that. Uh, natural gas, I believe, is the cleanest form of fuel on Earth. Uh, as far as is a, a, a petroleum-based product. Uh, it has, Charlie, two carbons, four, four uh, um, carbons. Give it to me again. Four. It's a four-to-one uh, comparison, uh, uh, natural gas versus uh, diesel. So those, those of you that are familiar with the diesel trucks and the diesel industry, um, all the regulation, all the guidelines have been involved with cleaning up uh, downstream of the engine. Yeah, we, we try to clean up the engine, but the, the, the thought there is that the, using diesel as a fuel, you actually start with a dirty fuel, and then you spend all that time with your engine and with all the downstream changes that have been made that have been EPA mandated, you spend all that tr time trying to clean up that dirty fuel. It's just the opposite with CNG. You start with a clean fuel. The, the only thing that our CNG trucks have beyond or downstream from the turbo is a muffler. It, it's, it's very refreshing when you look under the hood of a CNG truck. It's, it's a very simple process. But with that said, uh, uh, we, we had the first goal was to reduce our truck tailpipe emissions. We also wanted to reduce our fuel costs. Uh, we we uh, set a target delta of $1.50 a gallon. Uh, the, the email I got the, this morning as I was going through them uh, at, at our facility in Orville, uh, we paid $3.90 a gallon for diesel. That's on a 7,500 gallon transport load for a load of diesel. We are retail in Orville for CNG for $1.95. So if you bring your CNG vehicle to Orville, we will sell you all the uh, CNG you want for $1.95 a gallon. So we, we did not see that the $1.50 delta is a problem to hold. Sure. Is it sold by the gallon? It is. It is. Uh, and that's a very good, good question. Now keep in mind, CNG is, uh, is gaseous. Uh, but all... Uh, and if you are buying uh, natural gas for your business or even for your home, uh, you, you buy for it or pay for it in what manner? What's, what's the description you pay for it in? Like an MCF, right? Okay, well, that, that's, a, that's a tough one to figure out at the pump. 
if I pull up, uh, if soccer mom pulls up in her Honda Civic and she goes, uh, you know, and I'm not picking on a soccer mom, but it's okay, uh, it's by the MCF, how do I make the comparison and how do I get it more apples to apples instead of apples to oranges and the cost? And what we do, and uh, the, the conversion, and I hope these guys can keep me straight, we look at the, the BTU content of diesel or gasoline, and then we figure out how many BTUs uh, are, are in an MCF, a natural gas, and then we do the math, and then you, you are buying the, 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 the subsequent or similar amount of BTUs at the pump that, that you would get either in, in no lead or, or diesel. So we dispense by something that's called a GGE, a gasoline gallon equivalent. Does that help? Okay. What is the miles per gallon of the natural gas versus diesel that a, that a truck would get or a school bus would get? Okay. Ken, you want to answer that? I'll pass to uh, Charlie. I think with that GGE, though, is, is that not going to be similar? That's the purpose of that GGE. Yeah, and I was going to say it's the same or similar in the smaller vehicles. Uh, pickups and vans, typically what I'm being told, it's, it's actually a little better. Because keep in mind, natural gas is, is very, uh, very hot uh, as far as its octane. Uh, but in heavy trucks, you can expect it to be less. Uh, uh, I'm going to say what we're seeing right now is somewhere between 4 to 6 percent less than what we're getting in miles per gallon. Now keep in mind, we're pulling heavy loads, but it's, it's five to six percent less um, than, than, it's, than it's diesel equivalent. Now keep in mind, five to six percent less or four to six percent less in mile per gallon, uh, we can stomach that when uh, we're retail at $1.95 versus $3.90 for, for diesel. So the, there again, good questions, good things to factor. Yes, sir. Projecting out, where does your threshold cross uh, against the cost per gallon of natural gas as compared to your, your loss of mile per gallon. Where would you be not uh, <coughs> happy any longer? Where, where would I not be happy in a minimum mileage? Uh, I'll, I'll show... Uh, uh, I guess I'm saying if, if the cost of uh, natural gas it goes up, and it inevitably will, mm -hmm. uh, the reduction in your mileage, uh, you know, there's a threshold across there. Sure. What is that? That's a good, quest, uh, good question. I've got a chart that shows. Like this isn't going to be as effective and, yeah. and as yeah, and, attractive and, and, as it is now. Right, and maybe I'll get to the, maybe the root of your question is, uh, uh, what happens when natural gas goes up? Doesn't this project, doesn't the benefit of this go out the window? I mean, is that a fair way to, to rephrase your question? I guess if you're not just looking at it from a tree-hugging standpoint. Right, somebody's got to pay for it. Now, and if some of you city guys, you kind of expect the taxpayers to pay for it, right? We're a private fleet. There are no taxpayers involved, so we've taken a good, hard look at that. Uh, maybe some of that comes back, if I may answer that, of why is diesel right now 70 to 80 cents higher than no lead? Some of that's effective from the EPA when they reduced sulfur to zero parts per million. Okay, there's one question, or one answer, why? Well, a lot of it is diesel fuel is really a waste product of the refining process. Okay. And as, as efficiency, as they get better at refining gasoline out of barrel oil, they have less diesel fuel. fuel. They also use diesel fuel in tar and roof when they fix your flat roof when they put the pavement down. So there's just there's less diesel fuel comes out of a barrel of oil. Right. There's more demand for it, the same amount of demand or even more demand for it than there was the price of Right. And through the distilling or the cracking process, they're, they're, they're spinning off uh, less diesel all the time, regardless of the price of a, of, of a barrel of oil. But to answer, to answer your question, what happens if the price of natural gas goes up? I didn't bring that slide, but if you, if you look at a cost model for, for diesel, for the, 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 the base product for diesel, about 70 to 75 percent of what goes into diesel is actually the petroleum. So you don't, we don't have any control over that. Um, I think we're down around 20 or 22 percent on that same model 
is, is what's, what's in the natural gas model. So if natural gas goes up, uh, whatever happens in a natural gas market, that's only going to affect my pump price by 22%. If diesel goes up, which we expect it to continue to go up, it's going to affect our, our, what's going on at the pump by 75%. Now, with that said, is natural gas going to go up? You bet. I'm, I'm sure it will. But with the Marcellus and Utica shale play that's is taking place in uh, Western PA, uh, West Virginia, and now uh, fortunately Eastern Ohio, it's not going to go up like, like in, in our mind what we are anticipating it. Uh, I'm seeing, I saw yesterday forecasts that are out through 2025 that, that are showing no more Charlie than... 610. Yeah. Six... Six dollars and ten cents for an MCF go, going out. We know that's not going to happen uh, with diesel. And, and I'll, I'll, maybe I'll leave that more up to our panelists as we go, go on here. But the last thing uh, that, that uh, on that very subject that uh, on, I've got on this slide is this idea of reducing our dependence on volatile fuel supply. Now, now who is or what is a volatile fuel supply? First, who's the first people we think of? What's the first region we think of? The Middle East. Yeah, it's all those guys' fault, right? Um, well, I don't know. I don't know. It wasn't the Middle East's fault uh, that our fuel went up, the cost of our fuel went up uh, when there was a hurricane off the East Coast. It wasn't the Middle East's fault when the cost of our fuel spiked up uh, when there was a tsunami in Japan. It was not our, the Middle East's fault uh, six weeks ago in Orville, when the price of fuel jumped 41 cents in one day, there was no and no explanation given. That was not the Middle East's fault. Now they're a player in this, okay? But as part of having a goal with your projects, make sure you know who who that enemy is in our mind that we are defining. We've defined the enemy as a volatile fuel supply, whoever that is. That might be Charlie, the guy's from Chesapeake for all I know, but we'll, we'll let him, we'll, we'll, we'll give him his, yeah, we'll, we'll give him his time in court here in a little bit. Go ahead. Is there a road tax applied to CNG yet? Uh, the question is, is there a road tax on CNG? There, in the state of Ohio, there is a federal road tax. In the state of Ohio, there is no state road tax. I am sure Governor John Kasich will fix that for us. <laughs> Okay. I now, think that's, now, that's that, going to be a threat to your rise, and that's going to be a big threat to the rise of your fuel costs. No, it won't. I don't see it as a threat because, as a privately owned fleet running high, running the highway, we owe those dollars back. I mean, so we, we, we have we have factored for I'm that. Talking about no. driving the price of CNG. Up. I'm sorry. I'm talking about how it might drive the price of CNG up. It, it'll affect the price of CNG, but I don't see it as a driver because that, that same tax is there on gasoline and diesel. CNG, and uh, maybe to Greg's point earlier, what you're going to hear from at least me, CNG needs to stand on its own. And if it can't stand on its own, don't get in it. But we're in it, and as, as mentioned, we're, we're moving ahead with it. Well, let, let's go on before we, I cut this short. Here's one of my, my favorite pictures. Here is my CNG fuel delivery truck. That's it. Um, we've got a, a three inch line that, that brings us 50 uh, pounds of pressure into our compression site. Uh, that's it. If you manage a, 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 a no lead or diesel inventory and get into the, the hassles that are involved with that, you're gonna love CNG. At any one time, we only have 300 GGE or gas gallon equivalents in stock. That's it, it's, it's an on-demand system. We don't have to treat it. We don't have to worry about the seasonality of it. Uh, we, we don't have to do any of those things. It, it's an on-demand system. The startup was this. Uh, we were ready to go. Now keep in mind, much planning went into this, but we were ready to go within 90 days of groundbreaking on our fuel site. And then once we had the trucks in our hands, we were about 30 days getting the trucks ready to go. We started with six trucks running routes throughout uh, Northeast Ohio. 
And here's the application. And I mentioned earlier about the training and said that, that I was going to touch on that. If whomever your fleet is and whoever you're identified that, that, that may or may not want to get into this, if you're not willing to step up and raise the bar on your training, don't get into CNG. If your thought is, hey, let's just go get a couple pieces of equipment and put them in our employees' hands, I'm not sure I'd get into CNG. But if you're ready to train, if you're ready to raise the bar on your training program, go. It, it's, it has involved a lot of training. It's, it's very doable training. There's a lot of in, uh, very good industry people that are uh, in place and willing to help you learn. But it is going to take a lot of training. I, I think uh, we maybe have some uh, fire departments represented uh, here today. Uh, we had uh, 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 my local fire chief and the state fire marshal's office are, are my new best friends. And, and you, you want to get to get to know those fellows very, very well. It was interesting. We were about three months into this, and I got a call from uh, the state fire marshal's office and said, hey, I'd like to bring 25 local fire chiefs to your site uh, for training. And I was like, who am I to tell the state fire marshal's office, no, don't come over. Uh, but what I didn't realize, he wanted to bring them for us to train them. That was pretty exciting when we took our employees, took some of our youngest technicians that we have, sent them to school, got them to training, and then about 90 days in, they're now training local and area fire chiefs. And they had their attention. It, it, was, it was a great thing, a neat thing to be part of. Go ahead. On the slide before this, when you mentioned 30 days, to get a truck ready to go with the CNG. Mm -hmm. And before that, you talked about <coughs> buying through Freightliner, which I thought was equipment that was purchased ready to go with CNG. What's happening in those 30 days that you can't buy a, a truck ready to go, fuel it, and start using it? Uh, good question. If, if that was a, uh, uh, a light truck or van, maybe even a medium duty truck, uh, probably wouldn't have been the case. but. We took that, that 30 days is kind of things we do at Smith Dairy, uh, getting them ready for routes, getting them uh, prepared uh, to make the route application. Um, we, were, we were doing things like uh, we, we added air shields. Uh, the, I don't know if you can see the, the trim at the lower part of the bumper. We put in some sh shielding around the tanks. We put in catwalks on the back. We switched out tires, we identified them, we did all those things, and then we did some testing with them. We uh, loaded a trailer because one of the ongoing questions was, well, how far is this thing gonna run? We had to answer that question. We uh, loaded a trailer and left Orville with about 70,000 pounds on, and the, the driver that I was working with, his only direction was, go run this thing out of fuel. But the truck is, is EPA approved. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and, and to your point, n none of the none of that 30 days was a holdback because of Freightliner or if I chose Volvo or I chose Kenworth. It, it was not a holdback on their part. It was on our part. Well, then you leaned on maintenance quite a bit. What maintenance should we expect on these trucks? <laughs> You're going to see once your people are trained. The, the question is on maintenance. You're going to see uh, probably a trade-off. Um, a CNG vehicle versus a gasoline or diesel vehicle. There again, it's, it's, it's early on, so uh, the truck manufacturers, the en engine manufacturers, the transmissions in this case, who are the folks from Allison, we're, we're holding those intervals pretty tight on our maintenance just because we're starting to log some early miles running heavy vehicles. So we're anticipating a trade-off. Might, might be a, a penny or so uh, per mile higher, I really don't expect it to be lower. Does that help? So the training is then just to change your force from handling uh, diesel and, and gasoline engines to CNG engines and the special maintenance that they might require. Yeah, that's, that's what the word training, training, training. Exactly. And, and a lot of that training was safety because in the case of CNG, you're going to get the question, is it safe? Yes, it's a, one of the safest uh, known fuels on earth. But it's always going to come back to respect the pressure. These trucks, the fuel, the fuel tanks, the fuel vessels in these uh, tr 
trucks are 3,600 psi uh, at the at the the point of storage. Once we take that that fuel and move it up under the hood, we're about 120 psi. How does it compare to propane, and what's the safety issue on school bus? I don't know about the safety issue on school bus. You know, I just don't know that, have that background. I I know CNG. I from from what I've seen is as safe or safer than propane because the, some of the, the safety regulations are even higher than what's expected with propane. I, I do know that uh, the, the folks in Orange, Cal Orange County, California are running 3,500 CNG school buses. So I mean, there, there, there might be a contact if you want to talk school buses. I, I don't have a good background on schools. How does it compare to propane as far as pressures? Pressures? Well, is that the question? Pressures and as far as it's fed into the engine. I, I think once Jerry, once it's out under the hood, it's similar to propane, but the key is storage. I think propane's about 300 psi. No, no that's max. It typically attracts ambient temperature. We, we've got school buses operating in Ohio, and some of your school districts operate. They're pulling the buses in the garage and everything. They're, they're on time to go. So we're operating. So we, we've had. I just don't remember. I've been doing this 30, over 30 years worldwide, and we had school buses in the 80s, and everybody decided they want to get fat, dumb, and happy, go to diesel fuel. They got rid of all the CNG school buses. We had a lot of them in Ohio operating, and so uh, I just submit to you, if gasoline came out today, it would get approved as a motor fuel, but you have to prove that to yourself. But all these fuels are hydrocarbon fuels, and you need to respect them and understand how they work, whether it's propane or CNG or LNG or hydrogen. So that's what Chuck's saying, training, training, training. We've got, we got, uh, we got a new era here to work with, and so we've got to train people. Yeah, and then beyond that, the key is you're not going to get the power out of propane that you can get out of CNG. Question in the back. Yeah, um, you guys, you say you can place log at like 6 million miles in a year. With this system that you're going with, do you just, on these big trucks, they're all like day trippers, and they have to go make it back and forth on a tank because there's not a lot of refueling stations, or do you just know where certain ones are? Or how do you account for not having very many places to refuel out there? Uh, right now, and I'm not being a wise guy, it's all the above. Uh, we, we, do, we are day trippers. We're uh, more or less a tethered fleet. The guys come out and, and back that very same day. It is key right now to know where all those fuel sites are. And uh, I think maybe that's why we're having some of this discussion. Uh, there, there are more fuel sites coming on in Ohio in, tw in 2013. There's going to be some exciting movement with CNG fuel sites in Ohio. Um, but what we're doing is moving ahead uh, with this equipment where we know we can get out and get back uh, with, the, with the same amount of fuel. Now we're carrying, uh, uh, on that picture of that truck, uh, we're carrying a 80 gallons of, of fuel and uh, we, we know we can get out and back anywhere we want right now where those trucks are deployed. Yes, sir. Why did you decide to go strictly with 100% propane on your trucks as opposed to having a propane, gasoline, or diesel uh, combo of propane? Okay, well, and uh, just a point of clarification, not propane, compre compressed natural gas. We wanted to get started with the dedicated trucks because they're, again, there's that cost difference and, we, and the environmental difference. We can get 100% benefit of, of that if you run a dedicated vehicle. We are going to uh, add some uh, what the industry calls dual fuel uh, vehicles into our fleet in 2013. We're actually uh, putting this, some of those trucks together right now because one of the restrictions with a CNG is 320 horse on, on this, this version right now. Now, uh, the industry tells us there's a 400 horse model soon to be uh, introduced and things like that. We're not waiting. We can make more applications with this 320 horse uh, version that's out there, but then we, st we still, and I don't want to have a misunderstanding here, even though we're on target and we're saying we want to be diesel independent by 2030, we are still a predominantly a diesel fleet. So we're taking some of those existing diesel trucks and, and uh, retrofitting them with uh, what's called a dual fuel technology where we will now take and downsize our diesel tank and we will add a CNG tank so then when the truck starts and comes up to operating temperature on diesel, then we'll be able to blend in 
um, CNG and then run on dual fuel. Uh, best case, we're, we're probably going to say we're going to probably be running on about 40% diesel, 60% CNG. If that helps answer your question. Good questions. Yes. Have you been able to extend your oil change interval? No, we have not. No, and I. You want to answer that? Yeah. Okay, Charlie says he has. We have not. Uh, but <laughs> your heavy duty trucks. Yes, probably no. On light duty vehicles, we absolutely have. We change our oil on our CNG trucks about every 7,500 miles. So the answer on light duty is absolutely you can. Okay, the and there again. Light duty versus heavy duty, the thing you will need to keep in mind, the question was, have we extended our oil changes? Don't, don't, don't bet the farm on that one if that's part of one of your, your, your project goals, and at least in our case being heavy duty trucks. It, it's amazing how clean that oil is when it starts. It's amazing how clean that oil is when we drain it out. But do your, do your oil analysis, because what we're seeing is not dirt as we know it, not discoloration, but you will see a rise in acid content, which is, which is a natural impact of, of using natural gas. But it's clean. I mean, some of the drivers have really struggled when they pull the dipstick out. It's like, well, where is it? And you know, their first, oh, I better put more oil in it. No, take another look. There is oil there, it, but it's very, very clean. To the eye. Let's, let's, let's go on. I'll quickly run through this. But driver feedback, the, the two leading questions with the drivers is one, how's, this, uh, how's the truck going to be on power and is it going to get me back home? We answered both of those questions for them um, first week of operation. And uh, the, I knew about three weeks in when uh, the only complaint the drivers had on the trucks were the fact that the radio speakers suck. Yeah, I did say suck. Um, that, that I knew my job would, had just turned a corner and was getting a lot easier uh, because the, they were very pleased with the trucks. Future deployment, uh, where we're going? Well, what you're seeing is uh, one of the tractors pulling our, <clears throat> excuse me, our refrigerated trailers. Keep in mind, we're a refrigerated fleet. Uh, the, the, the lion's share of our vehicles are trailers with a refrigeration unit with a 50 gallon diesel unit. We're gonna work on trying to clean those guys up. The, the other picture, we run a lot of those straight trucks where we run not only the, the diesel chassis but the diesel refrigeration unit. Working on cleaning those guys up. We run quite a bit of yard tractors. There's a, a, a little company just west of us here in Hagerstown, Indiana, the auto car company that are building some very nice uh, CNG um, uh, yard tractors, and I know Auto Car is very active with some of the, the states and the counties and the municipalities on some some of their uh, specialized equipment. They they've been in CNG for a very long time. So, you know, wh where are we at? How are we going to pay for this? And and how's this how's this whole thing work? All, all I'm trying all I'm trying to say here is, if if I'm using uh, uh, those those. If I'm running those kind of miles on, on an annual basis and my diesel model, if I'm getting six miles a gallon and I'm paying $3.90 a gallon, um, and, and, and that, that's, that's going to be my fuel consumption. Here's my CNG version uh, where I'm getting uh, about a 5.4 miles per gallon. I'm retail $1.95. Here's my fuel consumption. Based on these numbers, I can pay off the difference in cost of that one truck. That is one truck's upcharge, okay? We can pay that back in 4.15 years. It's, it'll stand on its own feet. In our case, when we buy a truck, we expect 12 years out, out of a power unit. What does this mean if you just multiply that? Well, all, I'm, all I, I've done here is if, if I'm just picking a, a number, and in this case I'm using 40 gallons a day per truck, and I've got 20 trucks in, in that scenario, that's the kind of money the, that we're looking to save in fuel cost per year. Now keep in mind, I mentioned earlier, we, we've done a lot of things, uh, at least in the dairy business, and, and that's my background, and that's 
any, any uh, comment I make is based on that background, okay? We've made a lot of decisions in the, in the dairy business for those fractions of pennies, for those fractions of a percentage, of a percentage point. Uh, we, we lose business on, frac on just fractions, okay? When we initially looked at this, and instead of looking at fractions of pennies of savings, we started looking at dollars. We had a lot of people, including our chief financial officer, that didn't quite believe that. It's very, very true. You can save those kind of dollars, but it does take quite a bit of financial investment to get started. And then, of course, there's the training. Of course, there's the shop modifications. But those are very real numbers. A C&G fleet does stand on its own. I saw a question. Your mileage was 50,000 miles. Most of our users here are five. That's a factor of 10 difference. So, I mean, we're going to be very hard for us to make the same financial judgment you have here. Okay. And, and there again, I can, I'm, I'm only giving you this from the dairy side of the equation. But when I, what, what my comeback to that is I run miles, you don't. Let me ask you. How long does that vehicle run a day? How many hours is that running? Because you need to factor that one in. You know, I don't know how the, 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 the city, county, state vehicles are in your area, but in my area, I see a lot of them sitting and idling. So factor that one in. Good questions. Um, there again, to, to your point and to what I said previously, CNG isn't for everybody, uh, and I'll admit that right now, but we, we have found certainly a, a segment of our company where it fits. We're banking on the technology that, that's coming down the road that, that's, that CNG and possibly some other things are going to get us uh, where we want to be, and that's diesel independent by 2030. You say, well, that's, that's, that's quite a stretch. It, it, it is, and I was thinking it was quite a stretch until I met uh, with the National Fleet yesterday. Uh, then my hope and goal is they're going to start buying C&G in Orville. They're on pace to buy 150 C&G trucks a year. So they're, they're five years in, six years in, they're going to be 700, 800 uh, trucks in their fleet. And no tax dollars involved, no other incentives involved. They know it's the right thing for them. But it might not be a good fit for all, all of you, but at least challenge that thinking, if you would. And then uh, let me leave you with this as far as some key points. And I think maybe that's why uh, some of why we're meeting here. Do your research, and, 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 I, and I know you do, but do your research before choosing who you work with. Uh, it, it's going to come back, and what we saw this in our CNG project. If it sounds too good to be true, Chances are it is, okay? Do your research and do your, your, your due diligence. Uh, maximize your profit center by building critical mass. And there again, I believe that's a, one of the things we look at why we're here today. Find out who in the area also might be thinking these same things because it only takes one fuel site to service a lot of different areas. And then plan for change and allow for flexibility and reevaluation and adaption. And I say that, I'd mentioned the folks from the fire marshal's office that, uh, got, that, uh, that at least in my case, they're my best friends. Uh, I'll just end with this story. I, uh, two weeks before we opened our station publicly, our station was set uh, to dispense fuel publicly by something called a, a DGE. Maybe this is back on, on a, a prior question. A DGE is a diesel gallon equivalent. I got a knock at my door as one of the technicians says, hey, there's some guy here and he says he's got a problem with our fuel site. Okay, I, I, I had been hearing that a lot. Um, but bring him in. It was my friend, Jim Todd, from the Office of Weights and Measures. He came in to tell us that uh, there is no such thing as a DGE according to the Office of Weights and Measures. And if the Office of Weights and Measures does not recognize a DGE, we were not going to sell fuel that way. So, wow, Jim, you just wrecked my week. So, long story short, and, and when I mentioned GGE earlier, 
we had to reset everything that we were doing at the dispenser based on a gasoline gallon equivalent because that's what the Office of Weights and Measures recognizes. Now it's same or similar amount of fuel, same process that we're doing it, but plan for change and allow for flexibility because somewhere along the line, if you move ahead with this, whether it's trucks, training, whether a fuel site, someone like that's gonna come knocking at your door and say, hey, you know, you are on my list today to ruin your day. <laughs> So that, that's my presentation, and I know, do, Greg, do we want to take a, a yeah, short we're break? we're going to take about a five or ten minute break. There's coffee and uh, some cookies here. Restrooms are right out to your left. For anybody that cares to have a smoke, you can go out the back door uh, through the lobby. Uh, we'll meet back here in about ten minutes. We've got a really good panel that I think will be able to answer a lot of your questions. Thanks. Thank you. First of all, a couple of thank yous, and I think she stepped out, but I want to thank Kristen Gottman from our staff who uh, helped coordinate everything today. I also want to acknowledge Joe McKenzie. Joe is here from uh, Mine Valley Communications Council, and that's a council of government that serves uh, eight of our area municipalities, and uh, all of our cable franchising is administered through them. And they take care of all of our, uh, our local educational and public access television. So. They're uh, filming this today or videoing it in uh, digital format. It will be up and running on the mbcc.net mbcc website. Uh, you can click on Centerville. And there's a streaming video area there where you'll be able to pick this up probably in a week, Joe, 10 days. And he's also going to put it out on YouTube in about 10 days. So you can see it on YouTube. Just look for uh, Centerville CNG presentation. It'll be on YouTube here in about a week or 10 days. So Joe, thanks a lot. Uh, this time I'll turn it back over to Chuck. He'll introduce our panel. We'll have plenty of time for questions. And again, thank you all for attending. Thanks, Greg. Uh, what we'd like like to do is uh, in the, the second half of uh, our, our meeting today, and as uh, Rick mentioned, we want to move along and then get everybody out of here before noon. Uh, if you have any other questions, which I, I know there's been a lot of discussion and dialogue uh, during the break, uh, now would be the time to, that we can expand it, if I may, uh, from this standpoint, because there again, many of the things I've told you, uh, my comments came as, as an end user, as the private fleet, as the guy with the trucks, as the guy with the fuel site. Well, we'll expand on that now because uh, uh, as we were putting this meeting together, I thought maybe it would be better served for you and, and better interest for you if we also had some uh, other industry folks here. Uh, our, our, our first panelist uh, is Charlie Riedel, and Charlie's the marketing development manager for natural gas vehicles at Chesapeake Energy. You know, and, and, and as Charlie, or as Chesapeake's a natural gas vehicle manager in Ohio and Michigan, Charlie's focused on developing natural gas as a viable alternate fuel for uh, vehicles, as well as the necessary compressed natural gas uh, fueling stations to support, uh, to support conversions. And Charlie's on, on uh, closest to me here. Uh, got to know Charlie over the past couple of years, and Charlie and the folks from Chesapeake have been a tremendous help to us. And some of you have mentioned uh, training and resources that are out there. Uh, definitely the folks from Chesapeake are there. And then on, on the, the, the other end uh, is Craig Jackson. Uh, Craig is a business development, development manager for Kobe Energy. And Kobe has 25 years of gas compressor packaging history and now design and manufactures a CNG filling station product line in Buffalo, New York. Uh, Craig has seven years experience in the gas compression industry and currently focuses his efforts in, on the CNG market. He is the founder of CNG for Upstate New York, a collaborative industry group established to educate fleet owners on the benefits of natural gas as a vehicular fuel. Uh, Craig is also the coordinator of Clean uh, Communities of Western New York as a Clean Cities Coalition. Craig would be your fuel site guy. Uh, if you have those questions, uh, how, how do we go about do this? What's it look like? Uh, I'll, I'll put Craig out there as a resource. And then uh, in the center is uh, Dr. Jerry Hutton. Uh, uh, Jerry is the Director of Gaseous Fuels Transportation Partnership at Clean Fuels Ohio. If you're not familiar with Clean Fuels Ohio, they, 
They're an Ohio-based nonprofit. There was some mention on uh, municipalities and cities and uh, school districts on uh, funding and how-tos. Jerry, Jerry and his team at Clean Fuels Ohio uh, would be your, your go-to team there. Jer Jerry's now a retired dean of the Hawking College uh, Energy Institute in Logan, Ohio. From uh, 1990 through 2003, Jerry worked uh, nationally and internationally for various companies traveling South America, Mexico, the Pacific Rim, and Europe. His employment history includes such uh, companies as Trend Fuels, uh, Incorporated as Vice President of Engineering and Operations, Imco Technologies, where he worked his way from regional sales manager to marketing sales manager for Quantum Technologies, handling their Mexican and South American division in Alternate Fuels Technologies, LLC, where he worked as an LNG operations manager. He has published and presented articles with uh, such distinguished organizations as the Society of uh, Automo Automotive Engineers, American Gas Association, Natural Gas Vehicle America, International Natural Gas Vehicle Group, the Ohio Fuel Cell Coalition, Tech Columbus, and Green Energy Ohio. In 2011, Jerry was a recipient of the Honorary uh, for Remarkable Service in Education and Energy for the 129th General Assembly of the State of Ohio, Ohio Senate. And uh, Aunt May and Jerry is also Uncle Sam, I think, I had uh, Jerry in Southeast Asia, Asia for a couple years. And I didn't see that on your bio, but I, I wanted to include that and thank uh, Jerry for his uh, service there. So with that said, we've got uh, Chesapeake here who can tell us about how things are going out in the field. We've got Kobe here who can zoom in on actual fuel site. Uh, Jerry uh, represents uh, Clean Fuels Ohio and he'll field any other question that comes up. We're gonna give those to Jerry. So uh, I know maybe Charlie, we'll just start with you and go across the table. If you give us a snapshot of what's going on in, in the industry and then it, we'll be open for questions the rest of the time. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, everybody hear me? Yeah. Great. Uh, so appreciate you inviting me to be uh, part of the panel, Chuck, and, and excited to answer any questions that you guys have. Uh, for those not familiar, because this is not an area that Chesapeake spends a lot of time, uh, we're the second largest producer of natural gas in the United States, uh, followed uh, catching up very closely to Exxon. Uh, we have more active wells than any, uh, uh, any other company in the United States. We have more uh, active leasehold in the state of Ohio to the tune of about 1.3 million acres in the state of Ohio. Uh, working for natural gas, natural gas liquids and oil in the state of Ohio. So uh, I'm here and, and part of my team and responsibility is, is really focused on helping us to find a use for the commodity that we're, we're producing here in Ohio and Pennsylvania uh, and in 13 other states across the country. So natural gas vehicles is, is a really easy uh, dot for us to make those connections uh, as far as how we're going to move this commodity out of the ground and into something that is uh, a, a tangible use for every single one of us who gets in a car every single day and, and drives to and from work or uses that car as part of their toolbox. So uh, uh, focused on trying to really get natural gas vehicles in the car to Chuck's point where it makes sense. Uh, it does not necessarily make sense in every single application and hopefully some of those questions come up and we can talk through that. So thanks uh, for the invite. Yeah, thank you for the uh, time to uh, be here today. Uh, Clean Fuels Ohio, as uh, Chuck was saying, we're a nonprofit. Uh, I'm the director of the gaseous fuel area, so I touch on CNG, LNG, and, and uh, propane as well, a little bit on hydrogen. Uh, right now, uh, in the state of Ohio, the last year we formed what uh, we call NGV partnerships in five locations. We have two more locations uh, that will come online uh, the uh, first part of the year. We actually have uh, one in the Dayton area, and Chris Myers here in the back if any of you would like to uh, get involved in that uh, partnership uh, we'd be pleased with that make sure Chris uh, gets your information uh, as far as an email and a telephone number would be would be great uh, this next year uh, we're going to start and have uh, uh, webinars that will drill down uh, on about 14 different areas within natural gas vehicles such as cylinder technology compression technology, vehicle technology. So we'll be having those uh, webinars 
and uh, that information will, will go out. One of the things uh, that uh, we like also uh, to encourage is for you to join Clean Fuels Ohio. It's not just that we like your money, that helps us to uh, uh, pay our bills and so forth, but it uh, also it's the huge networking that we have. We're part of one of the clean cities uh, that's part of the Department of Energy. So we have other affiliates across the United States that we talk with, uh, so we know exactly what's going on in those areas. And finally, uh, it was touched on uh, doing, looking at your fleet and so forth. I do uh, fleet analysis, what I call phase one, and uh, there is a charge for that, but I would recommend if you're gonna look at natural gas or any of these, that uh, before you kind of take that step out is to, to analyze your fleet and so forth. As Chuck was saying, is natural gas uh, good for you or not good for you? And you can get through that, whether you go time fill, whether you go fast fill, what size compression, storage, a lot of, lot of uh, unknowns until you start with the basics of how much fuel you're uh, consuming. It's very interesting when I get some fleet analysis, uh, some fleets, uh, they're trying to find out really how much fuel they're burning, where they're filling and so forth. And that, that uh, is key to uh, whether or not uh, natural gas is a fit for you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, the way I see the state of the market right now is that with the Utica and the Marcellus shale drilling that's occurring, our northeast region, instead of being a, a net importer of natural gas, is now a net exporter. Uh, industry is saying that we have probably a good 100 year supply of natural gas that we're sitting on here as a region. Uh, to me, that's significant because as we're talking about what's the cost of natural gas going to be in the future? And one of those cost components of natural gas is the supply, other components of that, and Chuck will probably talk to this later, is the delivery. Well, the delivery costs are, are going to stay the same. The supply cost may go up a little bit. That's why we're trying to sell gas for natural gas vehicles, is to create more demand. Uh, however, overall, the cost is anticipated to stay rather stable and significantly less than diesel or gasoline. Uh, so where do I see the industry going is natural gas. And especially Pennsylvania and Ohio, I see lots of exciting things occurring here in West Virginia. There's just a boku of activity. So happy to be here and to help it move along. Thanks, guys. So uh, questions? Yeah, we, we can give you four different answers at this point. Yes, sir. What is the distribution network? I mean, I don't imagine that any of the governmental units would uh, deal directly. Uh, uh, so do you have distributors, you know, et cetera? Uh, so I think that if, if I'm hearing it correctly, I'll, I'll, I'll try to take a crack at this, and if it's not, then tell us. And like Chuck said, there's three more options here, so if mine isn't good, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll try till we get something right. Um, so, so the distribution right now, as you think about it, is as we're drilling wells in sort of the eastern part of Ohio and bringing that natural gas up, or the western part of PA and bringing that gas up, uh, we're drilling those wells much more rapidly than we can actually get what we would call a midstream supply to those to those wells. So the challenge is, and right now you've got a, a set of sort of your, your local distribution companies, so Columbia Gas, Duke Energy, Dominion East, those types of, the same company that, that you get a gas bill from every month in your home are sort of the transportation companies that we utilize to, to feed our gas into those, those transmission lines and get those out to uh, parts across the country. So. Uh, to the point of us being a net exporter here in the state of Ohio and, and Pennsylvania. I can tell that it's not the right answer. Well, no, I, I'm just saying, um, if as a governmental unit, we want to marathon, marathon and say, well, you have to deal with the, uh, our distribution partner in, in your part of the state. So is that what you're telling me? Right, so we're a deregulated state. Uh, but you would work with your LDC to pay your, your transportation costs there, but you could go to a third-party gas supplier and buy your gas from, from whoever you would really think give you the best hedged contract going forward. So a lot of these third-party companies will sell you a, a five-year hedge on, on a fixed price of natural gas. So to Chuck's point, with, with their fleet, and I won't, I won't speak out of turn here, but uh, they're, they're buying their gas on a, on a contract looking years forward so they know exactly what their natural gas portion of their com of their fuel price is going to be when you talk to a trucking company right now or any fleet for that matter right now when they go out and look at it and say i can't predict more than two weeks out because that's maybe what my fuel buy is is, is is that window is two weeks looking forward now all of a sudden i've got 
a five-year fixed commodity price. And to Chuck's point of that, that commodity is only makes up about 22% of the fuel costs. So he knows what that's going to be for five years looking forward. But they're working with whoever they really want to actually buy that gas. Your LDC is going to be the distribution point. So they're going to charge you a transport cost. And that's built into the state's rate case. Make sense? Yeah, and, and if, if I may, I'll, I'll tag on that because I think an, an earlier question was on, on price. What if natural gas prices go up? This is my opinion only, and, and I'm not saying this because Charlie's sitting here from Chesapeake. I, I hope actually natural gas prices do go up a little bit because, be, well, thank you, because we need the Chesapeakes of, of the world in the field doing the exploration, doing the doing all those things. I think the NYMEX was 365. 365 this morning. If Yeah, I mean I mean if it's four is five, if it's six, okay, I understand that, but the, the key is volatile versus stability. So we're, we're, my my read only, six dollars is still very stable for us. And I'm not saying that because Charlie's sitting here. Go ahead. Uh, both you and Dublin sell to the public. I, that's got to be a key solution for any of us who adopt this. How big a piece of the pie is that? Is that are they 10% offsetting your costs? Good, are they? Good question. The you know in our case the question is uh, Smith Dairy, the city of Dublin uh, have uh, public lanes and uh, and then their own private lanes. Uh, and how how much are we depending on the the public? for our, our, our station here, um, and I might have a better uh, photo there. Um, we were operational July 1st. In October, 20% of our volume was public. In November, it appears that it's going to be 30% of our uh, volume is going to be public. Uh, we, we had uh, some folks from uh, AT&T call us, with, and they've got these, uh, they call them a GTM, they're a tube trailer. Uh, we filled them for them, 900 gallons at a fill. It was a wonderful thing. <laughs> you know, so I'm thinking, Honda Civic at eight gallons, uh, AT&T at 900 gallons. Come on over, AT&T. There, there again, it's, you're creating opportunity. Um, so that, that's what we're seeing so far. Uh, had a good conversation with the National Fleet yesterday who has already bought equipment, and their only decision is, where do we deploy it? And I said, here's our zip code, 44667. Put it in your GPS. Bring that 18-wheeler to Orville. Chuck, I was just going to follow on to that, though. I mean, I think the, when, I, when we sat down and had our first sort of conversation, you guys were able to make this make sense. Yeah, thank you. And I, and I, I meant to say that our, our decision, uh, our, our owners and CFO made the decision on a 40-truck model. We, we, we pulled the trigger on trucks, pulled the trigger on, I probably shouldn't say that in the police department, should I? <laughs> we, we said go, okay? Based on a 40 truck, our own 40 truck model, we bought trucks and built a fuel site. And there again, open for the public, that's just, that's, excuse the pun, that's the kind of the cream on the top of the thing here. Good questions. So you mentioned shop modifications a couple of times. Kind of okay, the, the, the question is shop modification. Some of the keys are, keep in mind, gasoline and diesel, liquid, it, it falls, it puddles, it, it pools, okay? Uh, natural gas, gaseous, rises. So now uh, the, the focus on the shop now is instead of what's on the floor, it's what? It's what's up above. So some of the key areas, uh, if, if I may, would be where your electric is 18 inches down from the deck. <laughs> you know, are there any open electrical boxes and uh, things like that? The, the biggest one is your air changes per hour. Uh, I believe you need at least six air changes per hour in your building. Now, if you have a building that's probably 25 years old or younger, you're probably there as far as your air changes. But add into that uh, a third component, component would be methane detection. 
okay, I've got my vehicle inside, there's a release of gas, the methane detectors pick up on that, it's going to do a couple things. It's going to turn on exhaust fans, and it's probably going to open doors. Uh, shop doors open in Northeast Ohio in January, not a welcome sight, but it's, it's, it's for the safety of every, everything. So uh, air changes, methane detection, uh, that electric down from the deck are keys. Now, there's, if I may, I'll, I'll put a kind of a warning label in there. There's some people getting into the industry, okay, that'll tell you your shop modifications, you're going to need to spend Oh, a half a million dollars of the taxpayer's money. I wouldn't go with that first quote, okay? Get, get your electrical and mechanical engineers in, have them look at your building, and, and, and there again, most of you already have that design work done. It, it can be done for a lot less than that. We're, we're looking at probably about a $75,000 spend on a, a, a three drive through bay truck shop. Does that help? Good question. Yes, sir. Uh, on your fuel site, do you do your own maintenance there or do you contract that out? Um, both. <clears throat> and, and you can do one or the other or you can do both. And Craig, do you want to address that first? I, I personally always recommend a combination. I, I believe that your site people should be trained on routine maintenance because there's going to be daily, weekly checks that you're just going to want to do visual checks of the equipment, make sure everything's kosher. Uh, it, it certainly doesn't make sense to, to hire somebody to do that for you. Um, then there's other routine maintenance because typically the compressors are lubricated compressors. So the oil needs to be, there's a lubrication oil that gets collected out of the gas stream and that oil needs to be drained out and new oil replaced into the system. Again, that's something that your people could do because it's more or less just handling a five gallon pail of oil. Uh, however, let's say after a certain number of hours, it could be 4,000, 5,000 hours of operation, you're going to be talking about a major overhaul of the compressor. At that point, I'd say you want to be bringing in a third party who's trained on compressor maintenance because you're going to literally be tearing apart that compressor. Uh, you know, one thing that you might be thinking, well, what's the cost of that? And now you start talking about that's built into your operational cost number. And Chuck, you probably have done that. And industry expectations are say it's maybe 30 to 40 cents per gallon that you want to set aside for your, your compressor station maintenance. That's going to be your compressor, your dryers, your dispensers, all the equipment that, that would round into that number. And you're not going to see that hit initially. It's going to be something that's going to occur and you're going to see bigger cash outs for your maintenance as you get years down the road and you have to do some bigger maintenance. So it's something that you want to bank away um, right from the beginning. And what Craig described is exactly what we're doing. We, we have far, four of our own technicians trained uh, to, to do the day-to-day -day operation with the fuel site, uh, in, interact with all the other providers. And, and call them in, get them on phone, have them online or on site when needed. The, the, some of the key with the training is get your own people involved. Uh, the, I mean, the, the buy-in and ownership is an amazing thing. So your $1.95, does that factor in your maintenance and overall costs? We put 20 cents in there. There's 20 cents in that $1.95 for maintenance. As far as the development of these stations, are you seeing these as public entities, private entities? Um, what's the acreage? What's the cost? Sure. Uh, the question was, the stations are be developing, or am I seeing them as public or private or a combination of, of one or the other? And also, what's the acreage? Uh, the acreage, you know, I, I would, we typically are trying to shoot for less than one acre of disturbance in many areas because you stay below an acre and you're going to reduce the number of impact studies that you have to do for environmental impact studies. Uh, you can do on a one acre site uh, sufficient room to do something similar to what Chuck's doing here, maybe not as many lanes, uh, where you could get an 18 wheeler tractor trailer through that site. Uh, so I, I would always say you're going to try to stay less than an acre. You know, you're probably going to be at least a half an acre of disturbance. And it all depends on where you're located in proximity to the road and, and what kind of entry and egress issues do you have to deal with. Now, the, the public versus private, 
I, I would say a lot of the, the fleet owners are, are looking at doing a public aspect to it because they see that as a potential revenue stream. There is a, a significant cost. Uh, when I say significant, the, the numbers vary. And it, it's mostly on the dispenser side. So let me give you a for instance scenario. I'm sorry this is a long answer. But if you're a fleet owner and you want to do a time fill scenario, you're not really situated for a public uh, dispensing situation. Whereas if you're like Chuck here, where he's fast filling all of his trucks, so he's already set up to do public with maybe all he had to do was upgrade his dispensers to take pay at the pay at point of sale transactions. So that was probably about all the more cost impact he had. And it's obviously based on the numbers that Chuck is saying that that cost impact that he may have occurred to make it public is well paid for already. You're, you're looking at a million five. I, yeah, a, a million five there. Uh, there's installations I've seen that are as high as five million, and right. there's installations that I've seen that are half a million. And there's, you know, depending if you're going to only fill one truck, you could probably buy something used on the market and jerry rig something up yourself and, and do it for less than a hundred grand. So it really depends on the number of vehicles, number of gallons that you're trying to dispense. What are your fueling patterns that you see on a day-to-day -day basis? Do you have peak fueling demand? So uh, the best way, let's say if Chuck were running 40 of his trucks through his fueling within a three hour period, your compressors and your system needs to be sized to, to fuel up 40 vehicles, taking on 40 gallons a day within, let's say, a three hour period. So. You really, when you're sizing your station, you're looking at the worst case scenario. Uh, the tends to be the most cost efficient ways if you're a fleet owner and you could do a time fill where you're filling your vehicles overnight and you could plug them in. You could tend to be, that's more probably the more cost economical way to go. Main reason being is you can go with a much smaller compressor size. Chuck, having the fleet that the, that the public depends on 24-7, what kind of backup plan do you have just in case you have a major breakdown on your flooring station or you can't receive gas? That's a good question. Um, the, the question is what if, if we're offering um, public oh, well ourselves the, we're, our, our operation is 24 7 what's our backup plan? Uh, well th th that's a good question because uh, keep in mind as I've told you, we're in the dairy industry. Uh, how many times do we milk cows? Two, three times a day. What do you do with the milk when you get it in the truck? You take it to the dairy. You know, we're, we understand 24-7. Uh, our production manager uh, has a, has a, a co comment he likes to use, we're not NASA, we launch every day. Uh, so with, with that mindset, uh, we, we knew we would have to tackle that, uh, especially when we went public. Because, you know, if it's your own group of trucks or cars, sooner or later you'll find a way to get fuel in them and, and, uh, and get, get the person on the road. But the moment you factor in the public, and keep this in mind, if you are factoring in the public, the moment you factor in the public, all they understand is, I want to swipe my card, I want to hook up, I want to fill up, I want to go get my receipt, and I'm out of here. Anything beyond that, publicly thinking, is a problem. So uh, we, we have some redundancy with our system. Uh, the, the, we have two compressors, so if, if one is down or one is receiving some maintenance, uh, we, can, we can certainly do that. We have, uh, Craig mentioned, there's something called time fill or direct fill. We have also installed a, a, a time or direct fill post in. So if our card reader's down, if our dispenser's down, or in today's world, if it's just a matter of the software, you know, one's not talking to the other, we can still put fuel in vehicles. So we did that for a backup. That's not the way we want to operate, but we can get people uh, fuel. So bottom line is, as long as I have natural gas and electric, we can get you fuel. Well, I'm more or less like with our standby generators, depend on 911. You know, we don't even have, we don't even rely on natural gas. We have something else that, you know, 
what would happen if, what would you guys do if you had, had no natural gas supply? If we had no natural gas, I'd be in a world of hurt. I'll tell you that right now. We're, we're, we're banking on that natural gas line. Yeah, I just, I just want to make a comment. Uh, the unfortunate thing about Sandy, but a uh, major supplier and builder of stations, Clean Energy, uh, was able to operate in New York during the whole thing because the gas lines are in the ground. Typically, you don't have problems when you have a storm come through with gas lines. Uh, the, the electric lines are down. They were also back, backed up with generators. They were able to supply transport for people in the New York area during Sandy from the simple fact that the, station, the way the stations were built, the gas lines were not affected and so forth. So when you look at that, uh, just another uh, sideline. And uh, do we have uh, fire marshal, fire chiefs in here? Anybody? He's not raising his hand. Okay. Barely raise your hand there. Okay. You're all right. Uh, there, there is codes and standards for this industry. Uh, we worked on this for many, many years through NFPA, which is the National Fire Protection Association. Those of you that's interested, uh, you need to get an NFPA 52. That's the Bible that we operate under. Uh, NF, NFPA, uh, NFPA 70 is more the electrical standards and so forth for this industry. So there are codes and standards on the vehicle side. Uh, these cylinders, uh, if you would like to see uh, how these cylinders operate, someone mentioned YouTube. You can go on YouTube and put in severe abuse test of CNG cylinders. Uh, in 1983, Norm Folley set that standard. That's what these cylinders are tested to today. Uh, and I, I would submit to you that a diesel tank or a gasoline tank, if they had to even go close to the standards that we have to for these cylinders, they would never make it. Uh, so I would encourage you to look at those. Uh, if you, you can Google it up on or uh, pull it up on YouTube to look at that. But uh, the uh, uh, National uh, Association of, uh, uh, for Vehicle Standards, these cylinders are under that, the DOT and so forth. Uh, they go under dynamite test, gunfire test, severe abuse test, uh, crash testing and so forth. And again, I would say if you take a gasoline tank or a diesel tank and even attempt to do what we have to go through with these cylinders, they would never make it. They wouldn't even make the first impact. Uh, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll just add to that, one of the things as a fleet operator, at least in Northeast Ohio, that we're dealing with is I'm not sure whose great idea it was to use a magnesium chloride <laughs> as a de-icer. It, 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 it's eating our trucks and trailers alive. Uh, we, we, we have paid for store parking lots because of uh, pinholes or holes in, uh, in diesel tanks. The driver didn't know, the, the tank was leaking, pulled onto a parking lot, diesel fuel got spread on a new asphalt lot, the asphalt lifted, and of course, whose fault is it? It's the dairy's fault, so we're, we're buying parking lots, or repaving parking lots. That, that is not the case that we'll see now with, the, with these CNG pressure vessels. Uh, so, we're, yeah, I mean, just a very much a side note. Uh, Another question. Yeah, a question about converting existing gasoline or diesel engines. You know, we, we have a, we're a small city and we have a variety of different equipment from lawnmowers to fire trucks and everything in between. And like probably most of us here, we're trying to squeeze, you know, every additional year out of the existing equipment as we can. I mean, any sense of what percentage of our equipment, not knowing exactly what it is, which you can imagine, um, police cars, front-end loaders, dump trucks, you name it. What percentage of that equipment might be convertible versus having to wait to replace it? We're we looking at 50% or 20 or? I hate to say it, but it depends. I, I, I hate to use that because uh, those of us in the industry, we promote EPA certified systems, whether it comes from the factory or whether it's an aftermarket, what we call an aftermarket upfit. Uh, you talked about uh, from lawn mowers to dump trucks or whatever. Typically what we have to do, it comes back in the analysis, we have to look at the vehicle and see if there's a system available for that. Uh, is, there, is there room, available room on that vehicle to place those cylinders? Uh, if we're gonna take that vehicle uh, from, say from gasoline and, and maybe you wanna decide you wanna dedicate it, that's a term we use when you go to one fuel. Uh, is there room to, to move those cylinders around? So there's a lot of, a lot of dynamics to look in, into that vehicle uh, how many miles are on the vehicle? Is the vehicle worthy? Uh, again, uh, I know in the city, uh, Chuck talked about idling in time. You probably idle more than you drive. And so are you a candidate? Can you get the return on investment in a, in a quick time? 
uh, or if you convert your vehicles and we do what we call clustering or anchoring, if there were a, a station put in in, in Centerville, uh, you know, where can where could everybody uh, fill up from? I think the other thing that's important to keep in mind here as well, and Jerry touched on it, is the ROI side of this. So, uh, and to your question of looking to squeeze sort of the most out of these vehicles for as long as we possibly can, uh, CNG can definitely help that, but you've also got to remember there's going to be an incremental cost difference here. So okay, thinking through most of the fleet operators here are probably talking about light duty rather than Chuck's sort of heavy duty semi type of, of world. So uh, Chesapeake is a light duty fleet. We're about 5,400 trucks, uh, sort of quarter ton, half ton, uh, three quarter ton trucks, uh, Tahoes, those types of things as well. So similar to the types of vehicles that your guys are out in every day, for us, we're about a 30,000 mile a year fleet. So much different than most municipalities. I heard a 5,000 mile type of, of comment over here earlier. Uh, but that incremental cost on those light duty vehicles is somewhere around eight to $10,000. So you know, does this make sense in that world? It's hard to tell. Are you gonna run the truck enough that, and keep it long enough? You know, Most of the municipalities that I have conversations with tell me they keep a truck for five years and sell it with 25,000 miles on it. Or they keep a truck for seven years and sell it with 40,000 miles on it. And so you know, if that truck's idling, then yeah, we're probably gonna burn enough fuel. But for us, we're gonna see payback on that 30,000 miles with a $9,000 incremental cost in about two and a half, three years. So on you know, your light duty vehicles, your cost is much different than, than Chuck's $60,000 price point. It's about eight to 10, uh, but, but you still have to be able to justify your fuel volume. Are you gonna burn enough fuel through that truck for us, we try to burn about 80% natural gas. That's where we want to be, is burning 80% of our time running on natural gas. So the truck that's out in the parking lot is what's called a bi-fuel truck. It runs on either gasoline or natural gas. You have the ability to toggle back and forth. So if you do have to go somewhere, somebody brought up a question about range. Uh, if you do have to go somewhere, that truck still has the gasoline fuel tank in it. So if you run out of natural gas, you got a quarter tank of gasoline and you're in Columbus, getting back is fine because you're going to be able to stop at a speedway on between here and there and fill up with gasoline. So you have that option there. And until we see the infrastructure, you don't have to dedicate your truck to run purely on natural gas. You can run those trucks on either or. I'm aware of the uh, reserve grant funding and I'm to have to do as well. Are there any other funding sources out there, versions of replacement I'm glad you know about the dirt, and uh, we're uh, just uh, taking in for the 2013. Uh, the 2012 is, is underway. The DERG stands for Diesel Emission Reduction Grant. That grant is only for uh, vehicle technology. There's no uh, grant money in that for infrastructure. Uh, we have a policy director, Jason Phillips. Uh, we meet uh, with the uh, state, the governor's office, probably uh, twice a month. We're uh, involved with them quite a bit. Uh, we're trying to, to talk within uh, the governor's office and the Department of Development to see if there's going to be any uh, grant money available for infrastructure. But as, as of right now, the, uh, the DIRT grant is, is the only one that uh, we're involved with. I'm on your email list. If something did come up, I'm assuming that you would notify people on your email list about anything else that you want. You should have just got a notice from Andrew Connolly and, and uh, Beth Lamb uh, to you got a deadline to get in for 2013. Did, did you? Okay, very good. Turn it. If something comes up uh, that, that comes up that's federal or at the state level, we'll be just short of putting it on a billboard. <laughs> so. Yeah, the, um, I know state of Indiana's been very active on this, on this from, for some, some state funding. State of West Virginia, uh, Pennsylvania, Craig, anything in New York State? Okay, and, and, and that's pretty much where Ohio's at right now. No. Uh, what's, they're listening. They're, they're listening. Uh, uh, Charlie and Jerry and I were at a meeting at the Ohio State University two months ago, and Governor Kasich was there. I, I, I believe there'll be some things coming, but then you get into, well, do you fund the vehicle? Do you fund the station? Do you fund the trains? You know, you know. Uh, they're, they're, they're working. Just since you mentioned training, uh, 
Last week, uh, Cleanfields, Ohio, were awarded a half million dollar grant uh, from the federal government. And part of that, we'll be doing uh, uh, training within that, development training. And uh, we've done uh, some per first responder training. We will continue to, to do that. We worked with uh, Larry Fl uh, Flowers at the State Bar Marshal's office. A lot of questions on that side as far as safety, not only on the vehicles, but the uh, fill station uh, technology. And uh, the other exciting thing is, and uh, that's the reason Craig and I are here to talk about, is uh, we want to be able to track these cylinders. And so we're uh, going to start to look at some technology to track these uh, compressed gas cylinders uh, that are on the vehicle. Uh, typically today, they have a 20-year uh, uh, life. Once the 20 years is up, that cylinder has to be destroyed. And so as the vehicle rotates from one vehicle to another vehicle, uh, or excuse me, from one owner to another owner, we want some way to track that cylinder. Also, if that cylinder would happen to be out of, out of date when it pulls up to the dispenser, we really don't want anybody to fill it uh, because it's, it's past its uh, useful life. And so we'll be able to lock that, that out. The dispenser will not be able to uh, dispense that vehicle if somebody comes in with a cylinder that's out of test date. So we're taking a look at that and we're excited about working on that. Read an article a couple days ago, 22 states going together trying to collaborate on bids for public uh, vehicles and they're talking about price reductions of maybe, I'm hearing numbers from 4 to 8 percent from manufacturers, Ford, Dodge, that are already making CNG vehicles. Anything to elaborate on that? Yes, yeah, so, so that's uh, what we've got is a, it's a memorandum of understanding that 14 states have signed an additional eight or nine, I think, are, are sort of supporting it, but have not come out and said, yeah, we'll sign this. Uh, it's, it's turned into sort of a, they don't want to look like they're picking a winner. Uh, but what we're seeing uh, is, is really sort of taking all of those numbers, aggregating those numbers, uh, and then going to the auto manufacturers and demonstrating to the auto manufacturers, there is a market if you develop something other than a Honda Civic. We need a impala sized car that can have natural gas tied to it. Uh, we need something other than a, uh, a three-quarter ton pickup. We need you know that F-150 uh, to come ready for natural gas tied to it. So. One of the big things that we're hoping to get out of that is the state starting to adopt natural gas vehicles for the state fleets. And those are the four largest uh, state fleets are the EPA, uh, ODOT, um, whether I'm off the top of my head, uh, Department of Administrative Services, and there's one additional. But really where they want to start is, is, is there, implementing their vehicles uh, at that level at the state. State is, is committed to sort of a public-private partnership is what they've said. They, they want to be able to fuel at privately held stations. They're not interested in building the infrastructure. Uh, they want to be able to just have the vehicles and not get into the station building side of this. Will we see uh, CNG at filling stations as such, or will they be separate? So that is where I spend probably 70% of my time, working with the retailers to actually build these at their stations. So the answer is yes. Uh, you go to Oklahoma, where this has already sort of taken off. There are about 65 or 70 stations uh, at retail locations. You pull up your gasoline island, your CNG island absolutely already exists. Uh, we're in conversation, Chesapeake is in conversation with a number of retailers here to bring anywhere from 15 to 20 stations to retail locations. So the answer is absolutely. These will not be sort of standalone, drive behind the chain link fence type of operations. This will be where you send your wife there. You wouldn't have any problem with her filling up in the evening time when it's dark type of thing. Uh, so we want to bring these two retail operations to support light duty fleets. One more question maybe, we need to wrap it up. I, I do think that's a problem for large vehicles to be fueling up in the same location without separation with, with uh, regular vehicles. I mean, if you pull in the Flying J or the others, the trucks go one way and, and the passenger vehicle vehicles go uh, to a separate location. And as public entities, we're easy pickings for someone that wants a suit. I mean, we, we just are. And so that, that would be a real concern if, if we couldn't have a distribution center that is either separate or one that, uh, even if we went in, in partnership to control it. So, so I, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, and I think that we've seen that 
we have, city of Dublin, city of Columbus has, has really worked to try to create some of that. Uh, it's still, you're still gonna pull into the same parking lot. Uh, but what you're seeing now with the, with the retail side of this, the, 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 the public side of this, the public fueling where TA uh, announcing that they're gonna start building these stations and, and they're gonna have that separation. They're gonna create those, those different lanes uh, but Chuck has that. I mean, you, you, you pull in at their location and they've got purely for Smith Dairy trucks and the other side of the, the, the building, you can pull in and get, I can fill my car there. So they do have that separation and, that, and you can obviously, if that's part of your design, if you're going to build one of these stations, you want to make sure that you've got that separation on your property. And that's as simple as, you know, whether you want to put some poles up to sort of keep people out of it. Well, naturally, aren't the fittings bigger to hook up to a they commercial truck? Yeah, they, they absolutely can be. So oh. you're going to, right. But you've got to remember, to Chuck's point, the public wants to pull up. They're, they're not necessarily always going to know why is this not working when they've got to. <laughs> yeah, and and to maybe, maybe to that other question, and that the thought there may be the, 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 the public part of this might not be where you want to be. But to have s several uh, cities, municipalities have a, hey, have a site that, that you all share with those types of vehicles, then I'm guessing that that might be a fit. Uh, like, like I said, our, we, we, we did everything based on our own 40 trucks. We added, we added the public with it because we, we were comfortable with that. Our risk manager was comfortable with that. But the public might not be a good fit in, in your situation. You know, if we went back 100 years when I was just a young kid in 1912, uh, th this country didn't have gasoline stations. If you want to get on a gasoline, you had to go to the pharmacy and get it. Can you imagine that? So what, what we're looking at here is change. People are resistant to change, and they get into a pattern and so forth, and so there's going to be some, some differences here. Chuck mentioned horses and so forth. Can you imagine a gentleman that hauled freight by horse, teams of horses? There were teams of horses hauling freight in 1912 in Ohio. And then somebody came up and said, hey, I've got this truck that burns gasoline. And they go, oh, well, I don't know. I can feed my horse green and so forth. So a lot of change went through to build the infrastructure in the gasoline that we have. So now we're taking a look at a new fuel, a new, a new time, and a new era. So there's going to be a lot of, of, of different uh, modes, different ways to fill. But as uh, uh, Charlie was saying, we're talking about a lot of the majors, whether it's the Speedway, up in our area, Inglefield Oil, which, which is a marketer for BP and so forth. These people seriously are going to look at this. Uh, and I agree, you don't want these heavy trucks in where you've got the cars and so forth. And uh, again, the city of Columbus, huge ones, the city of Dublin, uh, you can get in and out of there. One gentleman asked about refueling nozzles on the high flow, like uh, 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 CODA in Columbus, Central Ohio Transit Authority, their station is going to open in April this year. Code is going to all natural gas with all the city buses. In the next 15 years, they're going to change all the buses over to natural gas in the city. Uh, the city is building another station up on Morris Road. They're going to build another. They're going to have three refueling stations in Columbus. So as time goes along, we'll see this change of a whole new refueling infrastructure uh, that's, that's going to evolve out of this. Just one last comment. Again, thanks for coming. Uh, please make sure you're registered over here with your phone numbers, email addresses, so we can keep in contact with you as additional information becomes available. For those of you who are in the immediate Dayton area, uh, we'll be contacting you in the next few weeks to see if you have an interest in an additional meeting as we talk about the potential to maybe establish a, a site among uh, several communities here. So uh, have a great day, and I'm sure our, our speakers will uh, stay around for a few minutes. If you have any questions, and I'd like to acknowledge their, their efforts, please give them a round of applause.